Welcome back everyone. It has been a while since I've made a video, some computer headaches involved admittedly, um, but I still wanted to get back to it and haven't really spoken about my public portfolio in a while, so I figured today I would give some commentary on that and uh, kind of recap last year and just some quick thoughts on how it's going. So the intention when making this portfolio and when talking about it is never to give financial advice because I don't do that ever. Um, what the idea is, is to give a slim down quality enhanced version of something like what my portfolio looks like. And honestly, that hasn't been going as well as I'd hoped. Um, well, I'm not necessarily disappointed with the results from this portfolio. They were significantly different from my actual portfolio, and that wasn't the goal. And I've been thinking about why that is and if there's really a way to fix that. Now, I think the main reason why the results have been different is mainly a factor of sizing. In this portfolio, um, the sizing is kind of standard. Um, you know, initial position 5K, I can double it to 10K of initial capital, but it's kind of standard and stamped, if you will. Um, versus the real portfolio, it's a lot more nuanced. I'll have some tiny positions and some really too large positions at times. And so the goal with the real portfolio was always to um, make the most money relative to the risk you're taking. Um, focus on, you know, if there's really one thing that you like more than others, you'll have a larger position. Here, my thinking my, has more so been to provide ideas. So it's not as much about really trying to have this portfolio very much overweight the same spots that I'm overweight. So that has probably been one of the reasons why at times things can get different. The other thing is stupid positions. Now, I'm sure you can look at the stocks in this portfolio and the performance and tell me all about the stupid positions because there have been some uh, mistakes, some entrance mistakes. Um, but really, I have tried to filter out some of the risk in this portfolio. And I think that, you know, some of those times, and this has worked in both directions, some of the times I've mentioned something here. Um, only after uh, it has gotten a better price um, or, you know, sometimes I'll take a risk and it will either work out well or work out terribly. And in this portfolio, I might not be taking the same risks. On the sizing, some of the biggest differences I can think of are Arch and Linamar are relatively smaller in my real actual portfolio than this portfolio. Arch was just kind of outgrown by the portfolio. Now it had a really good year this year, um, but that didn't contribute as much to my real portfolio as it did for in this one versus um, Linamar, which actually as of the second quarter, I think, started having a tough year because of, you know, supply chain issues and stuff like that. And so that was actually bigger in this one also than my real portfolio. Now it's something both were things are things that I really liked and do own. It's just a matter of where the performance um, has shown up. On the flip side, Verde and Dream are both actually larger in my real portfolio than in this one. The other ones don't stick out to me as something that is uh, way out of size versus um, the other side of the portfolio. 
Which leads me to my next comment, being that investing is a game of leveraging winners. By that I mean taking a win and turning that into a bigger one down the road. Now, either you can do this yourself by selling a winner and putting the money elsewhere, or a company can do it um, by compounding capital and or growing a lot over time. It doesn't matter, but the point is, over time, your positions should be able to matter more uh, than perhaps an earlier position. And along the similar lines, you always have to consider where you are now and what is still remaining to come. For example, you know, let's say you have a position that's at its eighth out of 10 bags because you bought it at one and you thought it was worth 10. It went to eight. You know, the market doesn't care if it's eight out of 10 bags. It cares how much upside's left and how much downside's left. And, you know, that's kind of how you have to think about things um, over, you know, to expand your portfolio. Now, on my portfolio, on this one and my real one, um, there's definitely, as always, room for improvement. In that, looking back, most sales were bad. Most times after something was sold, it continued going higher. Now, some of the times I could argue that the place I put the capital instead uh, might have made more sense, although sometimes not, and in this portfolio, perhaps not. Um, so that's something to consider going forward and work on improving. Similarly, getting my backside kicked on poor entries that's also not new. In fact, um, a number of times, if you look back, I didn't actually buy something at a great time. Um, so although you could say that the middle or the holding period as a whole has net been positive, um, entries and exits are definitely something that I have not optimized fully. So I don't want to do too much of this, but I will give a few comments on some holdings. First by theme, autos, they had a rough year, particularly Q2, 3, and 4, um, but I have strong hopes for the recovery, and so that's why I still like the two of them that are in the portfolio. Uranium, still bullish uranium, I do at this point prefer generally um, physical to equities, um, but it has to be considered that, you know, sometimes there's equities that have more upside or more beta, and also there is downside or discount risk in the physical too. I think home builders in Canada, in US, North America really, I mean, uh, should do quite well over the some indeterminate uh, period. Uh, I don't know if that is over one, two, three, whatever, how many years. You know, there's of course always risks for the short term. Interest rates uh, could do some damage to the housing market. So that's always your risk in the short term, but there is a structural shortage of houses in North America. And I don't see that going away anytime soon, just based on the numbers I look at. Gold sentiment is worse than price. The gold price isn't, isn't that bad. Uh, there's lots of money to be made at $1,800 gold. Um, and I think the plays that are in this portfolio are cheap and resilient to any potential downside and can benefit from higher prices as well. Now on the stock specific side, I really thought my Met Coal play would have been at $150 by now. I, just based on prices, based on fundamentals, based on the you know quality of the asset, the build out, all that, I would have thought it would be there by now. It isn't, and I'm honestly not sure what to do with that fact. Healthcare play, 
um, was my number one bad investment of 2021. And although partially I, I can understand there's been some disruptions, I'm still not under sh sure why it went as badly as it did. Um, yeah, it's it still looks like it should be growing and still looks like it has a lot of runway ahead. I mean, there's been some disruption, been some uh, readjusting of the trajectory of earnings, but overall, I don't really know what went wrong. Acon, um, people didn't really like what Acon had to say in their last call. Um, it was really sounded to me just like uncertainty on one project, not necessarily a problem or anything bad. Um, also, the um, the backlog might not have been as good as some people had hoped. I don't really think it was problematic. Um, and so we'll have to see uh, what they can do going forward. But I really think when you look at the business, you, the way I look at it is I break it into parts. There's two parts. There's the concessions and then there's the construction business. So when I look at the concessions, that's, I would give, you know, a safer business type of thing, different multiple. And I think that can do north of $80 million a year. So in EBITDA. And so then, you know, if we want to strap on an eight times multiple to that bit, um, you get to, uh, you know, then you look at the other part, which is the construction, which is where the huge backlog is. And yes, some of the construction is reoccurring revenues. Some of it is one-off contract work, but still you look at the 6 billion backlog for that. And that segment would trade at an EV to EBITDA of like two and a half. And I, I just think it's worth well more than that. And I'm also don't think I'm being uh, overly aggressive on the concessions. So I think it's pretty cheap as a whole. And but, you know, it's it is what it is. And the market has sold it off a little bit recently. I think once there's clarity on the pipeline and all that stuff, uh, it should recover. So Verde is a stock that I've spoken a lot about and mostly what I've said still applies. Um, the only new commentary I would add is that if I believe if a rational analyst were to be looking at the company's recent guidance and looking at the targets and looking at, you know, where they fundamentally thought growth would be and look at the situation really in general, I believe they would still come to the conclusion that it is a very interesting stock. Um, could say a lot more about it, but wouldn't want to just rant. Um, so I'll just add that haven't I haven't sold any. Voxter. Voxter, the profitability should be coming soon. Um, it, in my opinion, that's the biggest deal. That's the biggest thing to look forward to. Um, I think that that would remove the concern of debt and hopefully remove the uh, prospect of dilution. Um, I dislike using sales multiples. I don't really look at things that way, like price to sales. It doesn't speak to me. So profitability would also kind of move us closer to a point where we can look at earnings or EBITDA just in terms of defending the downside and giving it a realistic um, concept of multiple and risk. I think that if they can de-risk to the point where I think they should be by this date and time, um, then it would allow for a larger position because I still like the potential. So some brief market thoughts. I got a little bit more defensive than I needed to a little bit earlier, but I'm still liking the general 
uh, positioning of my portfolio here, and I think it's probably the right move. I believe that inflation will be lower in 2022 than in 2021. And there are some, that might mean that there's some risk to some inflation hedge trades. Um, take that for what you will. You know, a few years ago, I had the, I'm not sure if it's gold or uranium that will move first portfolio. And it was gold. And, you know, I think on in some ways the concept is similar now um, in terms of what would be the next thing to move um, from a bullish standpoint in terms of, you know, uh, once gold moved, it was kind of your risk reward is better for for uranium. But I'm, basically, I'm back to I don't know which one is the better risk reward, but I think both have more risk than before. Just a matter of where the price is rather than anything um, fundamental shifting. So looking back, very little about 2020 was anything resembling normal. We had this incredible collapse and then this surge afterwards brought on by a number of things and then into 2021 where we still had this broken supply chain broken economy um, different world and so 2021 was dealing with a lot of knock-on effects of what 2020 set in motion now my thinking is that 2022 will tell us more about what the new normal looks like but I think that it will be closer to the old normal than what many seem to be thinking in 2021. But I don't know what exactly will be different and there may be some significant things. So basically, I think it's pretty unclear um, what 2022, 2023 and onwards will look like, um, because there's a lot of stuff rolling off and stuff kind of fixing itself. So it's a messy picture. And, and I think that's why being defensive at some point will make sense. But it also means that going forward, um, my portfolio at least is going to start having some efficiency issues. You know, there's not always a new thing that you can buy that's going to flip and go up for you to sell and then flip to the next thing. Um, you know, there's sometimes where you want something that's going to be a long term hold, and that probably means that it won't go up as much, but it will be a safer uh, grind for the future. And so the tax efficiency part of the portfolio is probably going to weigh on returns, um, at least what it looks like returns would be, but it couldn't provide a nice defensive part of the portfolio. So the relevance of that is in a few places. One, I have started putting more consideration into longer term and quality in what I'm adding to my taxable account. In the non-taxable account, it's more business as usual in terms of trying to get the better risk reward and not really being overly concerned about someday being half, uh, having to sell. Now, I mention this here because one of the things that I get, I wouldn't say flack for, but I get comments about is that I don't post a lot of videos. And the thing is, I often will post when I do something, but if I have a concentrated portfolio with more longer term positions, there's less that I'm actively doing in terms of buying more things. You know, capital constraint. So looking back at the end of 2020, the portfolio looked exactly like this. Now at the end of 2021, I took this screenshot, which is the same one 
from before, um, just but updated from what I've said through the year. Um, I tried to block out a few things that Yahoo broke. You can kind of rewind and see what I mean. If you want, you could do your calculation. You don't have to because it doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, so this is what the portfolio looks like, and this is trackable. And so this segment of the portfolio, there was a lot of um, money that was taken off the table. And there's still a chunk of the portfolio that is still at play from two years ago now. And this is the same thing, the portfolio of the ad additions from 2021 through the end of 2021. Now, some of them have only been in there for a few weeks. Others have been in there for many months. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed picture. But again, portfolio overall um, results can be judged. Now, measuring the returns can be done really a few different ways. The way I did it was just a simple way. Um, looked at the 2020 portfolio in 2021, and that returned 69%. And so I weighted that based on how much money was in that one versus how much money was put into the 2021 portfolio. And now that I'm thinking about it, I probably didn't do this perfectly but anyway so 26 percent in the 2021 and um 69 percent weighted to about 60 percent now i do think that some of the key takeaways over the past few years have been that crazy isn't necessarily better you don't need to make some crazy parlay bet you don't need to take on super amounts of added leverage or risk to get the better returns but you do i guess need to be right and need to have enough in the positions where you're right in order to capitalize fully on the asymmetric risk reward remember many potential multi-baggers are zero baggers in the end so you know, risk has, there's a place for risk, a time for risk, and it's not always. And lastly, things that shouldn't happen will happen. And you can't really predict what that will be or when that will be. And you just need to realize that more will move the markets than what you believe should move the markets. I mean, this is one of those things that you kind of know until you kind of have to feel it. Which leads me to my next point, and that is that the public portfolio has more positions, and I believe it's generally, perhaps with the exception of one position in my personal portfolio, I believe the public one is uh, more cyclically exposed than my personal account. And I don't necessarily like that at the current moment, but I don't really know how I would go about fixing that because I do think that while this cyclical exposure is riskier, um, all of the positions are ones that I like and own, and I think that there's more upside potential in the cyclical one. So it's a bit weird in terms of I wanted this to be a um, less risky version of my actual portfolio, but it's kind of through rebalancing and such has become perhaps riskier, but I don't, I'm not really sure how I would go about measuring that. But anyway, I'm just want to say that, you know, when we're talking about cyclicals, there's a lot of commodities in there and I'm fairly cautious about commodity price. I think that, you know, there's there's some risk. There's, depending on what we're talking about, there's some risk to the downside. But broadly, I just want to say that, you know, 
you enter commodities because you want to hedge inflation at a time when nobody wants to hedge inflation. Now we're at a time where at least more people are thinking about hedging inflation. So from that respect, it's not like you have this free upside in the inflation hedges. So in that way, that ship is sailed. Now that's not to say that commodities are going down. That's not to say that there won't be more inflation, just that it's not um, as asymmetric as it once was. So more caution is needed. That's not to say that I'm bearish. And that's about it for today's little recap. Um, obviously, 2021 was a good year, um, well above a reasonable long-term average to expect. Now, going forward, I'm doubting that there will be um, the same type of returns, partially because it's perhaps a more challenging environment and also because I don't see as many opportunities, although I am still looking. As always, I wish everyone the best. Any commentary is welcome. And until next time, good luck.